The importance of the history in, t in making the diagnosis of rotator cuff tendonitis is paramount. Patients oftentimes give you very clear signs that they have rotator cuff tendonitis, not just because they have shoulder pain, but because they describe problems raising their hand over their shoulder to comb their hair or brush their hair. They have problems when they lie on that side at night and are frequently unable to sleep due to pain on that side. These are very common problems with rotator cuff tendonitis, as well as the location of the pain in the lateral shoulder oftentimes establish the diagnosis and make you only want to focus on the shoulder and rotator cuff pathology when it comes to their physical exam. Examination of the shoulder begins with inspection. Inspection is best accomplished by having the patient disrobe so one can look at the normal carriage of the shoulders relative to the chest. This is most directly examined by asking the patient to sit in a neutral position so one can examine the, the clavicles, which insert on the acromion bilaterally, and the, how the patient holds the shoulder relative to the rest of their body. When one looks at the shoulder posteriorly, one can see the posterior landmark of the acromion right here. One can also appreciate the medial border of the scapula. And remember that the scapular spine comes down at an oblique angle from the shoulder. The four muscles of the rotator cuff involve all arise from the scapula. They involve the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the subscapularis, and the teres minor, which arise from the inner aspect of the scapula. And these all coalesce to insert on the greater tuberosity of the humerus as a flat tendon uh, that is as a group referred to as the rotator cuff tendon apparatus. Remember that most shoulder pain is usually caused by the process of rotator cuff tendonitis. Therefore, we will spend considerable time discussing this as we review shoulder pain and shoulder motion. In terms of palpation of the shoulder, it is important to remember the bony landmarks. The bony landmarks involve the acromion, the coracoid, which constitutes the medial boundary of the glenohumeral joint, as well as the most important area for rotator cuff tendonitis is a subacromial space that one feels right here at the lateral margin of the shoulder. Just below the edge of the acromion is usually the site of maximal tenderness that people describe when they have rotator cuff tendonitis. However, it is important to remember that historically when you take the history from these patients, many of them will not complain of pain at that specific site. They'll complain of a general dull ache in the lateral deltoid inferior to that area and will be quite surprised when you tell them that this is a rotator cuff tendonitis pain. Many times they will tell you that they think that this is actually a muscle pain. The examination of the shoulder uh, with focus on the rotator cuff involves abduction of the shoulder in a lateral plane. When asked the patients to put their palms down by the side on the side of their thighs and then to bring them slowly over their head all the way uh, as far as they possibly can. A normal arc is about 170 degrees from the thighs to over their head. The rotator cuff motion contributes to this in two different ways. The first thing, the rotator cuff apparatus, which is made up of the subscapularis, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, the sits muscles initiate the first 5 to 15 degrees of abduction. The next 70 to 75 degrees are mediated by the anterior deltoid. And this is process is generated by the rotator cuff muscles, which are depressing the humeral head, allowing the humeral head to slide under the distal acromion. The remaining 90 degrees are scapulothoracic and involve the scapula rotating on the thoracic cage. When patients have rotator cuff tendonitis, what happens is that at approximately 70 degrees of abduction, the humeral head begins to pinch the rotator cuff apparatus and one can experience crepitance at this point or pain. This arc from 70 degrees to 120 degrees is described as the painful arc of rotator cuff tendonitis. In patients with rotator cuff tendonitis, what happens is that at about 70 degrees they begin to experience pain or loss of motion. This is due to the fact that the second job of the rotator cuff apparatus is to depress the humeral head while the deltoid is abducting the arm. At this point, patients can experience not only just pain and not only limitation of motion, but oftentimes feel a clunk, 
as the humeral head dives underneath the acromion due to impingement, that is the underside of the humeral head hitting the edge of the acromion. There are other maneuvers that help you diagnose the presence of rotator cuff tendonitis. Some of them are provocative. One that is quite, uh, quite useful is asking the patient to pat themselves on the back by reaching across with their left, sho left shoulder or their shoulder to reach back and, wet and ask them if this, this generates pain. This maneuver, known as adduction, causes uh, in a patient with rotator cuff tendonitis or insufficiency will cause pain because the humeral head will be being compressed against the labrum and the acromion as it is placed in adduction. Patients with rotator cuff tendonitis will not be able to do this without significant discomfort. A second provocative maneuver for rotator cuff tendonitis is to ask the patient to abduct against resistance, starting from leaving his arm alongside the body. So one asks the patient to abduct their shoulder against resistance. And if this elicits pain that refers up into the subacromial space or lateral shoulder, this is a very specific finding for rotator cuff problems, such as inflammation, tendonitis, or tear or all three. Remember that rotator cuff tendonitis is also known as uh, subacromial bursitis. Generally, you know, this involves uh, the process of rotator cuff tendonitis or subacromial bursitis involves tears primarily in the distal supraspinatus tendon. However, it can occur in many different sites in the sits musculature. But in general, the most common pathology involves the supraspinatus tendons. The subacromial bursa lies around the supraspinatus tendon uh, near the insertion point on the greater tuberosity of the humerus, hence the use of subacromial bursitis as a synonym or synonymously with rotator cuff tendonitis. The next maneuver that's very important in evaluating rotator cuff arthritis is that of is the asking the patient to elevate their shoulder. This process allows you to discriminate between rotator cuff tendonitis and glenohumeral arthritis that may exist as either a primary or a secondary process. In addition, this also allows you to address the possibility of adhesive capsulitis or capsular contraction where the shoulder capsule has contracted around the humeral head and is limiting motion. One asks the patient to bring their arm up over their head in the ventral plane or the anterior plane, and if one is able to do this normally, this indicates that the glenohumeral apparatus and the glenohumeral joint are perfectly intact. If this same individual has trouble with, with that painful arc between 70 and 90 degrees of abduction, but he has normal elevation, then one has established the almost certain diagnosis of rotator cuff tendonitis. The final two maneuvers that involve the shoulder involve external and internal rotation. These are oftentimes involved by both either glenohumeral joint arthropathy or arthritis, as well as rotator cuff pain. Specifically, one asks the patient to externally rotate the shoulder to the maximal extent, and most individuals can come to 90 degrees like this individual can. This represents normal shoulder external rotation. This can be involved with, this can be limited by rotator cuff tendonitis, but is a better marker of shoulder arthritis. The second component is internal rotation, which involves having the patient Help bringing the elbow out to approximately 30 degrees and having the patient internally rotate their shoulder as far as they can. One usually expects somebody to have approximately 90 degrees of internal rotation, but that's, at, that's on a, in a very mobile shoulder. 60 to 70 degrees is normal. This is frequently restricted by rotator cuff tendonitis as well as arthritis. Therefore, decreased external rotation or decreased internal rotation are not necessarily specific findings for rotator cuff disease in contrast to the issues of painful arc that I discussed earlier. Rather, these are processes of limitation, limited motion that can occur with either rotator cuff pathology or glenohumeral pathology. Yet another uh, possible cause of shoulder pain is that of bicipital tendonitis. This is a painful syndrome that people describe usually when they are trying to pick up something heavy and involving flexing the arm. The way one examines this is to have the patient flex their, for, flex their forearm against resistance and see if this elicits pain. If this does elicit pain in the location of the long head of the biceps tendon, this is consistent with bicipital tendonitis. 
This maneuver is also known as a Jurgensen maneuver, and typically one feels the bicipital tendon moving under one's thumb as one flexes and extends the arm. It is not uncommon to have patients experience some tenderness at this site normally. This is uh, quite a tender spot in patients with normal pathology, without any pathology. Therefore, it is important to remember that really one has to reproduce their symptoms that have been guided by your history with this, uh, with this maneuver for this to be an accurate diagnosis.